My name is Ryan Harris and I'm an underwater archaeologist with Parks Canada. And we have a real treat for you today as you're going to be the first people in the entire world to witness a live broadcast from the wreck site of HMS Erebus. One of the two ships from the lost Sir John Franklin expedition of 1845. I'm joined underwater here today by my colleague from uh, the underwater archaeology team, Thierry Boyer, who's doing the camera work, and also by leading seaman, Caleb Hooper, from the Royal Canadian Navy Fleet Diving Unit Atlantic, who's going to be making sure that our umbilicals, which should say our breathing hoses, don't fall on the wreck site to damage the wreck. The three of us are going to take you on a guided tour of this remarkable shipwreck site and we're going to make some several strategic stops to show you some of the most interesting parts of the wreck. So that's it. Why don't you follow me? So here is the first stop on our tour of HMS Erebus. And this is pretty much the first, one of the first features we saw when we inspected the site with our remotely operated vehicle, our underwater robot, last September. Your Navy, you're at the end of your umbilical. What you see here are two brass six pounder cannon. We were able to determine the caliber of the guns by measuring the diameter of the bore of the gun. So these guns would each shoot a six pound cannonball. Now you might ask yourself, why does an exploration ship have cannons on board? Well, at the same time, it was also a Royal Navy ship and it was sent into, into the Arctic with a minimum armament, we believe of one 12 pounder and two six pound two six pounder cannons. After it was meant to go through the Northwest Passage, Erebus and Terra were meant to go all the way back to England via the Pacific and yeah, they never knew why or what situation they might be in where they would actually have to defend themselves. So these two beautiful guns were a clear indication at the outset that we were indeed looking at a Royal Navy vessel. Here we are at the stern of the ship. This big timber to my left is the stern post and this is the rudder post. The timber to which the rudder was attached. One of the most interesting things about HMS Erebus is that along with HMS Terror, it was one of the first two ships to be modified to have a screw propeller for polar navigation. The ship was provided with 12 days of coal and they were told to only use the steam engine when there was no wind to drive the sails or when they had to get through a temporary opening in the ice called a lead. So they didn't want to have the propeller in place all the time because it would just slow them down. So what we see in here is the mechanism by which the propeller can be raised and lowered out, in and out of position. So these bronze tracks allow the two-bladed propeller to be lifted up through an opening or a well in the deck when it wasn't in use. The point of this is that when they were overwintering in the Arctic, the ice couldn't tear away the rudder post or the propeller. And they'd actually fill up this space, this called the, the propeller aperture, is where the propeller would turn, right where I'm looking at you. And they'd fill it up with uh, wood to protect the stern during the winter. Next, we're actually going to proceed up to the top of the upper deck and take a look where the men would have walked on the ship. Let's go. Now 
now we're on top of the quarter deck. This is the part of the deck all covered with kelp now where the officers would have controlled the ship. What I'm looking at here is the rectangular outline of a skylight. And this is essentially a window that would have looked down into the ward room where the senior officers would have taken their meals. Officers like Commander James Fitz James, the second in command, Stephen Stanley, the ship's surgeon on Erebus, and Lieutenant Graham Gore, the first lieutenant. This large cylindrical object beside this guy light is actually the ship's tiller. This is the log contraption that would have allowed the ship's wheel or the helm to actually turn the rudder back and forth to steer the ship. So this tiller would have gone all the way back to the top of the rudder or the rudder head. And it's very long, it's over 12 feet. It's made out of bronze to be quite strong. And this is because when they added the propeller to Erebus in 1845, they had to make the ship a little bit longer. So they needed a longer tiller. A little bit farther forward of the skylight over the wardrobe, we put this feature of the upper deck. This is the tallest part surviving on the wreck of HMS Erebus. This is actually the ship's capstan. The capstan was essentially a large barrel that would turn on its axis and it was used to provide mechanical advantage for managing the ship's heavy sails and yards, the various spars for controlling the course of the ship. The capstan would also be used to assist the windlass farther forward in retrieving the ship's heavy anchors and anchor chain. Let's proceed farther forward towards the main mast. Here we are at the site of the main mast. The tallest of the three masts on the ship, the top of it has been broken off. Just as the Inuit say, when Erebus sank, they found it the following spring, but only to the point where they could see the mass still sticking above the surface of the water. So the broken top of the main mass shows how the ice violently carried the mass away soon after it sank. On either side of the main mast are these interesting features here. This is the port side bilge pump. These are the pumps that sucked water right out of the bilge to these tubes here so they could get it out of the hold. Any wooden ship takes on water and if it isn't pumped out regularly, the ship will sink. So this attractive brass bilge pump it's actually a, a patented massive bilge pump and there will be two tubes. It force air down one tube and suck water out the other. It's a double action pump. What we don't know is how HMS Erebus sank. Possibly after the last crewman left the ship, there was no one left to pump it out anymore and it gradually filled and sank. <laughs> 